Julius Caesar is considered by most historians as the greatest military commander of all time. You may have heard about his war strategies, battle tactics, and perhaps his career history, but I bet you don't know how he convinced a continent's population to follow him, or how he made the region's largest army adore him. In this episode, you'll learn the leadership tactics used by Julius Caesar, the methods he used to convince and influence others. You'll discover strategies that you can apply in your job and elsewhere, and you'll hear the real reason why the potato is so popular. Why are Russian leaders called Tsars? Why is the month after June called July? And why does each year start on the 1st of January? Well, if you read the title of this episode, then you probably guessed the answer. It is all down to Julius Caesar. He is undeniably one of the most influential and successful humans of all time. Sars and Kaisers are named after him, the modern day calendar was implemented by him, and the month of July is named in honour of him. But when most of us think of Julius Caesar, we think of him as one of the greatest military commanders of all time, or perhaps one of the greatest Roman emperors. Much has been said and written about that. However, today on Nudge, I'll look at something slightly different. Not what Caesar achieved, but how he achieved what he did. I'll share the persuasion tactics he used. I'll uncover how he influenced others, and importantly, share what modern day leaders can learn from Caesar. Now, you don't even have to be a leader to learn from Caesar, because many strategies and tactics that Caesar used throughout his life weren't just to bolster his leadership bids. No, he used these tactics to make better decisions and live a happier life, and also change the behaviour of others. I'll share those tactics today on this episode of Nudge. But before we dive in, I wanted to give a shout out to the podcast How to Take Over the World. Their episode on Julius Caesar sparked my interest in the man. So after this, if you're keen to learn more about the life of Caesar, go and give that show a listen. I've linked to it in the show notes. Okay, let's begin. We'll start with an example from earlier in Caesar's career. It is after one of Caesar's first battles as a military leader in Bithynia, which is located in modern day Turkey. Caesar had been successful in this battle and was celebrating with his soldiers as he sailed back to Rome. On the way back, while sailing across the Aegean Sea, Caesar was captured by pirates and held captive. This wasn't uncommon at the time. Pirates would capture military leaders or other men of influence and hold them captive to ask for a ransom. Caesar was 22 when this happened. It was extremely early in his career. He didn't come from wealth and he hadn't accumulated much wealth yet. He had seen success at the start of his career, but he had a long way to go. You can imagine most people at Caesar's age being pretty terrified by this situation. The pirates will hold you captive, put a ransom on your head, and if it's not paid, they'll kill you. So listen carefully to what Caesar did when the pirates announced his ransom. The pirates demanded a ransom of 20 talents of silver, the currency at the time. Upon hearing this, Caesar says, don't you know who I am? And insisted. The pirates raise the ransom from 20 talents of silver to 50 talents of silver. He said 20 isn't nearly enough, I'm worth much more than that, don't ask for less than 50 talents of silver. This is irrational behaviour. The higher the ransom, the less likely it'll be paid and the more likely Caesar will be killed. No normal person would do this, right? They would bargain to get the ransom lower. But Caesar isn't normal. He knows the power of costly signalling. He knows that by placing a higher ransom on his head, he'll only increase his perceived worth and grow his influence. Ultimately, his ransom was paid in full, and Caesar, once freed, raised a fleet to capture and crucify his pirate kidnappers. Time and time again throughout his career, Caesar used this tactic of costly signalling to boost his worth and to change others' perception. But what is costly signalling? Well, Rory Sutherland puts it nicely. When defining costly signalling, he says, the meaning and significance we attach to something is felt in direct proportion to the expense with which it is communicated. This is why a hand-drawn picture carries more meaning than a printed photo. It's why a diamond ring feels more important than a silver ring. And it's why when asking someone out on a date, in-person requests work much better than messaging that same person on Tinder. Caesar knew that costliness carries meaning, and returning to Rome with a 50-talent ransom paid will boost his reputation more than a 20-talent ransom. After returning to Rome, he'd used the same tactic time and time again. 
As a young military leader, Caesar would spend extraordinary amounts of money hosting public parties, parades and festivals with extravagant feasts. He'd spend more than any other leader on these parties. Why? Because he knew that these expensive parties would help build his popularity. By signalling his commitment to the people, he'd boost his reputation. But he didn't have money to host these parties. As I mentioned, he wasn't particularly wealthy. So he took another risk, another irrational risk, accumulating 31 million in debt. That's 60 times his annual salary. This was another costly signal, one that other leaders wouldn't dare to make. When Caesar's wife, Cornelia, died, Caesar was 30 and his wife was 28. Caesar was due to depart for Spain. At the time, funeral ornations were not particularly held for young women like Cornelia. Funerals for younger women were a strictly private affair. But Caesar decided to change the status quo. He hosted an extravagant funeral ornation in honour of Cornelia, which was extraordinary at the time, although later it became commonplace. It was another costly signal, breaking the norm, spending lots of money on this funeral. This risk could have backfired on him, but it didn't. Like the public parties, it only built his reputation. Now signalling, especially costly signalling, isn't something Caesar invented. It's commonplace throughout human civilization and throughout nature. Charles Darwin identified costly signalling while studying a peacock's tail. Darwin couldn't understand why the peacock's tail was so large. It was an oddity in the natural world that contradicted his theory of evolution. He wrote, The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Darwin's conundrum was answered in 1975 by Amort Zahari, a biologist at Tel Aviv University who developed the theory of costly signalling. According to Sahafi, costly signals are harder to fake and therefore more believable. The ability to survive despite a cumbersome tail conveys a genuine genetic fitness to potential mates. Less fit specimens don't have the agility available to avoid predators when handicapped with a long tail. Now, I've spoken about this previously on Nudge, about how stotting spring boxes signal their strength to prey to avoid being chased, and this is the same thing. As I mentioned, it's not just in nature though. Costly signalling is something that seems to have been part of civilization throughout history. Many of the Roman leadership positions in military, but especially in the church, involved costly signalling. Caesar took up a number of priesthood positions throughout his career, and they involved lots of sacrifices giving up personal liberties to prove your commitment to the job. In one of his earliest priesthood positions, Caesar wasn't allowed to ride a horse, he wasn't allowed to leave Rome for more than three days, and he had to always sleep within touching distance of mud. This is all costly signalling designed to prove his commitment to God. It's the same reason why the modern day Pope can't marry or commit sacrilege. But Caesar went further, creating his own costly signals to build his influence. The most obvious example of Caesar creating his own costly signals comes in 60 BC after winning a number of military battles in Hispania, modern day Spain and Portugal. Caesar was awarded the greatest honour any military general could achieve, a triumph. A triumph is a massive ceremony to publicly celebrate and sanctify the success of a military commander. It is only given to a handful of military leaders each decade. In total, there were only 320 triumphs throughout the history of the Roman Empire, so Caesar was joining a very exclusive club. A triumph is bigger than a Nobel Prize, bigger than a knighthood, bigger than an Oscar. Arguably, it's every modern day award combined and multiplied. It would easily be the pinnacle of any Roman's life. So guess what Caesar did when he was offered a triumph? He gave it up. He said he didn't need it. This was unheard of in his day. Now, it is a little bit more complex than it sounds. See, Caesar wanted to stand for council, the highest position in Rome, but he wouldn't have had time to have had the triumph and apply for council that year. So he gave up the triumph. But still, it is a major surprise. He could have chose to run for council later and take the triumph, but he didn't. He gave up the triumph instead. Knowing Caesar's history, it's not surprising to see him take this route. Sure, the triumph would do wonders for Caesar's popularity, but being the only person to decline a triumph would elevate Caesar's aura to legendary status. It is the ultimate costly signal. The meaning and significance Romans attach to Caesar is in direct proportion to the expense he occurs, and nothing signals that expense than giving up the biggest prize of all. Now, the life Caesar lived couldn't be more different to our lives today, but it is easy to see how the exact same principles could be applied in modern day work. 
A president who gives up their inauguration in favour of fixing the economy would win unparalleled trust. A CEO who takes a 50% pay cut rather than doing a round of redundancies would gain unwavering trust from staff. A billionaire space entrepreneur will gain more attention and trust if he puts himself in the passenger seat on a dangerous space flight. It may sound contradictory, but to win influence, you often have to give up the things you gain with that influence. But costly signaling is not just about gaining influence. The same tactics can be used to motivate other, to convince an employer to hire you, or to make your advertisements more effective. So far, we've learned how Caesar used costly signaling to build his influence and persuade others. He told his pirate captors to demand 50, not 20 talents for his ransom. He held incredibly expensive, lavish public parties that put him in unparalleled debt. And he gave up the greatest prize of all, his own triumph. But the use of signaling didn't end there. Like many other successful leaders, from Steve Jobs to Genghis Khan, Caesar signaled his elevated talents through what he wore. Unlike most Romans of the time, Caesar wore a long sleeve togo, very different to the typical short sleeve. It's a signal that says, I'm different, I don't follow convention. This tactic of dressing differently to your peers has been studied and even named. It's known in psychology today as the red sneakers effect. The researcher Francesca Gino noticed the phenomenon at scientific conferences. Most would dress in a smart suit with polished leather shoes, but at almost every conference, there would be one person who stood out, one who turned up in scruffy red sneakers. Paradoxically, these poorly dressed participants were almost always the most qualified and experienced. They were the well-renowned scientists in the room, with the most Nobel Prizes or the largest amount of grant money awarded. Gino, the researcher, decided to study her hunch. She coded the clothing worn by attendees at a series of different academic conferences. The researchers devised a rating system and would categorise how formal the individuals were dressed. The researchers then looked up the number of publications each scholar was cited for as a measure of status within the academic community. So basically, they looked at what someone wore and then they looked how many times they'd been cited in papers. After controlling for the attendees' age, gender and years since receiving their PhD, the researchers found that wearing jeans and a t-shirt, in other words, a non-conforming style, was significantly correlated with research productivity. Interestingly, this correlation was even stronger when focusing on publications in top-tier journals. Dressing differently can signal your competence, and often those who dress differently have the competence to back up their unique style. Caesar knew this well before the likes of Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, and you can argue that those two still follow his tactics today. But to Caesar's credit, he didn't just use simple signals like fashion to signal his wealth. He took a number of major costly signals too, and he did so to motivate his teams. See, one of Caesar's greatest strengths throughout his career was the commitment of his army. They loved him, they vouched for him, they convinced other soldiers to join him, they were his biggest advocates. I'm sure many managers listening to this would love the same to be true for their team. Wouldn't we all love employees to do anything to support our goals? So how did Caesar do it? Well, he did it with more signaling. First, he memorized the name of all of his soldiers. This wasn't easy. He had hundreds of soldiers. Knowing each of them by name required a commitment that most other generals didn't have time for. But Caesar knew it would signal that he cared. I think this is a genius leadership tactic, and it's a simple enough task. Just write down someone's name and study it later. It's a small thing, but it can have a big impact on the individual team member. Caesar did something else as well. He also addressed his army not as soldiers, which was usual throughout the Roman Empire, but as comrades. This address was less hierarchical and made the soldiers feel like Caesar was addressing them as equals. It's surprising to me that modern day armies and police forces haven't applied something similar. Caesar also ate and slept with his soldiers. Now this is very unusual. Generals would rarely eat with their soldiers as the quality of the soldier's food was far worse. And also soldiers slept outside in open air, sometimes in freezing temperatures. Again, not something a general would do. What's more, Caesar was much older and much more feeble than his soldiers. He suffered from epileptic fits, something that was brought on through the soldier's poor diet and poor night's sleep. His soldiers recognised this. They knew that this signalled his commitment to his army, and it only made them respect him more. 
Julius Caesar paid his men more than usual, he'd buy them better armour, and even have special pieces of armour commissioned for his bravest soldiers. You could read a hundred books on motivational management strategy, and you'd struggle to find advice as good as this. Caesar showcased his commitment to his team at every possibility, giving up all the benefits awarded to him by his position to win the trust of his men. Unfortunately, it's really difficult to find a modern day leader like this. All too many get drunk on their wealth and the power their position commands. It's rare to find leaders who forego their benefits in favour of helping the masses. It's much more common to spot leaders who do the opposite, abusing their powers to gain advantages that the masses can't. But showcasing your full commitment to your team, like Caesar did, will win you trust, helping you hit your goals and also overcome periods of downturn. See, life wasn't always rosy for Caesar. There were several periods throughout his career where he looked dangerously close to failing. The standout example comes from Caesar's most important battle, the civil war with Pompey, another Roman leader who fought Caesar for control of the empire. Caesar had been successful in the earlier parts of this battle, taking over Italy and forcing Pompey and his army to Greece. Caesar didn't want to stop there, however, he wanted to ensure victory, so he shipped his army over to Greece and continued fighting the war. But there was a problem. It was winter. Now, back in Roman times, you simply didn't fight in winter. You couldn't. Other than fighting, the main challenge a Roman army faced was food. Roman armies needed to stay well fed for weeks at a time, and during winter, that's near on impossible. There's often no food available and no option to grow more. After landing in Greece, Caesar got lucky. His army discovered that the local root vegetable could be harvested in winter and baked into bread. Problem was, this bread tasted disgusting. It was barely edible. Pompey, his adversary, tasted the bread and declared, we're not fighting men, we're fighting animals. That's how bad the bread tasted. Sure, Caesar's army would eat it to survive, but Caesar was facing a genuine chance of mutiny. Without the unprecedented trust he'd built, his army would almost certainly have given up by now. So how does Caesar overcome this problem? He's stretched thin, close to being beaten. How does he raise the morale of his army? Well, he uses costly signalling yet again. He happily eats the bread in view of his comrades. He spends as much time as possible eating the bread in company of his soldiers. He says this is the food of kings, this is the food of champions. If we can eat this food, then there is no challenge we can't surmount. It reminds me of how the Prussian king Frederick the Great encouraged the masses to eat the potato. This is a story from the 18th century and the king was facing a real risk of famine in Prussia. So to help solve the problem, he decided to cultivate the potato, a brand new food at the time brought over from South America by Spanish explorers. The potato was easy to grow and promised to be a vital new food source. So Frederick the Great passed a new order to ensure that potatoes were cultivated. But there was a problem. The peasants didn't want to touch the potato. There was a saying about this, what the peasant doesn't know, he will not eat. The potato was foreign, it was flavourless. The peasants remarked that even the dogs wouldn't eat it. According to Professor Robert Cialdini in his book Influence, Frederick the Great used a classic marketing trick to overcome this problem. He limited the availability of the potato, making it a scarce resource. But importantly, he also had fields of potatoes planted around his palace in Berlin. He ordered his army to guard the fields to put on this high-profile show of protection. As you can imagine, this aroused plenty of interest from the peasants. Suddenly, this undesirable potato became something of legend. It was a scarce food that only the king cultivated. Surely the potato had some value, why else would the king guard it 24-7? Obviously, this trick only made the peasants want it more. Frederick the king knew this, so he told his guards to purposely be relaxed with their security. They were told to take naps at predictable times, to look the other way as a peasant stole some potatoes, and it wasn't long before the potatoes became widely cultivated and are now firmly established in the Austrian and German diet. Over the course of a few months, the potato went from being something the dogs wouldn't eat to a key ingredient in every meal. Belarus and Latvia, two modern day countries that were part of Prussia, are now the largest consumers of potato per capita globally. And you can argue that is down to Frederick's 200 year old marketing trick. It's akin to Caesar's strategy. He made the bread seem like food fit for a king, and this subtle reframing made it much more appealing. And Caesar's army recovered from being close to collapse in winter to overthrow Pompey, defeat him, and cement Caesar's position as the almighty leader throughout the Roman Empire. 
all thanks to Caesar's brilliant motivational strategy. Caesar is undoubtedly a one-of-a-kind military leader. He's intelligent, he has tactical nous, and he has a democratic acumen that puts him head and shoulders above his peers. But Caesar knew that competence alone wouldn't build the influence he required. He knew that to persuade a nation to build unwavering trust in his army and to ultimately rule an empire, he needed to signal his competence. And like many great leaders who came after him, he went above and beyond, using costly signalling in every possible way to persuade and convince others. Caesar might be from a different millennium, but many of the tactics he uses are still appropriate today. Giving up an award will win you more praise than accepting it. Remembering the names of your team won't make you seem try-hard, it'll make you seem diligent. Celebrating your success with others rather than hoarding your wealth will win you influence. And putting yourself at genuine risk in your attempt to hit your goals will only make people believe in you more. I decided to apply some of Caesar's tactics myself to see if they still work today for people like me. Now, I don't have an army to lead, and I don't have an employee to motivate. I can't give up any awards because I'm yet to win any. But I can test costly signalling. I can test Rory Sutherland's point that the significance we attach to something is felt in direct proportion to the expense in which it's communicated. To test this, I came up with a simple idea. I had two surveys asking 200 people, will you listen to this podcast? In the survey, participants would see an advert for Nudge. It said, bored of boring business podcasts? Try Nudge, and then contained some images of my five-star reviews. But there was a twist. One group of participants would see the ad just as I've described it. The second group of participants would see the ad superimposed onto a billboard. It was the same ad in both scenarios, just one was on a billboard. Now, I should mention here that people are viewing this ad online, so there's no real billboard there. It's just superimposed on an online image. My hypothesis here was that the billboard version should trigger costly signalling. By merely suggesting that I'm spending lots of cash to promote my show via a billboard, that should make people more likely to listen. After all, Caesar's extravagant public parties that put him in unprecedented debt only made people more likely to listen to him. So I published this survey on Google surveys whilst it was still live, recruited 200 random participants from across the UK and spent a few days collecting the results. And the results? Well, they didn't surprise me and they shouldn't surprise you. They merely confirmed what Caesar knew all those years ago. After seeing the billboard variant, 7.4% of participants said they would listen to the show. Of those who saw the control, the variant without the billboard, only 3.9% said they would listen. Both sets of participants saw the same ad, but one was superimposed on a billboard and it made people 90% more likely to listen. That is the power of costly signaling. And if you like, you can take a look at that Google survey in the show notes by clicking the link. And hello to all the listeners who saw that ad and thank you for actually coming and listening to the show. You, just like the people of Rome 2000 years ago, were influenced by costly signaling, a principle that frustrated Charles Darwin grew the popularity of the potato and propelled Caesar to Roman Empire. Okay, folks, that is all for today's show. Now, if you liked this episode, I think you will love episode 63 of Nudge. It is with Rory Sutherland, the advertising legend who runs the Ogilvy Behavioral Science Lab and wrote the best-selling book, Alchemy. On that show, we discuss everything from costly signaling to the simple ways to improve train travel. It is one of the most popular episodes on Nudge to date, and I think you'll like it. So I've left a link to it in the show notes, but you can also find it by scrolling back through the episodes and selecting number 63. If you're keen for more content like this, then please sign up to my newsletter. I'll send you more psychology-inspired wisdom to your inbox every week. You'll learn tips not just from Julius Caesar, but from Steve Jobs, Jose Mourinho, and even Mr. Beast. And as always, you can apply these tips to your work. So just go to nudgepodcast.com and select newsletter from the menu. You can sign up there. Now, I spent a couple of weeks researching this episode and pulling it together. It's a lot of hard work, so I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you want me to produce more shows like this, then please share the show wherever you can. Give it a five-star review if you can. And make sure you subscribe to the show on your podcast player. That's really important. Doing that will help the show grow and, well, give me more time to produce episodes like this. I'm Phil Agnew, the host and founder of Nudge. You can follow me on Twitter at P underscore Agnew, that's A-G-N-E-W, and on LinkedIn at Phil Agnew on there. Send me a message and I'll promise to follow Caesar's advice and remember your name. I'll be back in a few weeks with another episode of Nudge. Thank you again for listening.